Hello and welcome to another video from me, Rough Swordsman Wargamer. It's another playthrough of a tutorial scenario from Task Force Carrier Battles in the Pacific, a game by Jinichiro Suzuki and published by VUCA Simulations. And this is scenario three, the last solo tutorial for the game. So let's have a look at that. Here we are, Scenario 3, Battle of the Java Sea, February the 27th, 1942, and the game objective, you will take command of the Imperial Japanese Navy in the first inter-fleet engagement of the Pacific War, where a strong Imperial Japanese Navy fleet, tasked with the defence of transports for an invasion of Java, met with a mixed force of American, British, Dutch, and Australian ships. It's a one-player scenario designed to show you the naval combat rules, intership battles, and torpedo warfare. And uh, here are the rules we need to play. So let's uh, have a look at the setup. The Japanese Navy have three formations, Fleet Task Force 7, 8, and 9. And the scenario suggests we put the ships in order of size as it were because this will help us when we come to the naval combat normally as you saw in the last scenario we would put the ships next to their escorts and they would add their air to air values to any planes coming in but in this scenario there aren't any air raids so we'll just keep them in order from largest to smallest so task force seven is the fifth cruiser formation and we've got a couple of heavy cruisers there and two units of destroyers. In other words, four destroyers. Fleet Task Force number eight is the second torpedo formation. And we've got a light cruiser and two units of destroyers. And Fleet Task Force number nine, the fourth torpedo formation, slightly larger with a couple more destroyers. For the Allies, we've got the ABDA. Combined striking force, America, Britain, Dutch, and Australian. And we've got a couple of heavy cruisers, three light cruisers, and the rest are destroyers. The USS Houston, though, enters this battle with significant damage. Hence all the smoke coming out of it. Again, we're only using part of the sequence of play. We're using just the naval movement phase of both sides, naval combat, both sides, and it's simultaneous, and then the administrative phase. And the administrative phase might be a bit more involved because some of the ships might be able to do emergency repairs, and that occurs during that phase. So that's the units involved. Let's have a look at the map. Here's the overall view of the map. This is where the counters are gonna go. I've zoomed out to show you this. The movement for the allied forces up here will be controlled by this compass. And during the day, formations can move one hex. And during the night, they can move two. And this will determine which direction the allied forces go on a one, two, or three. They will move northwest and four, five, or six west. And depending whether it's day or night, they will throw the die at once or twice. Right, let's zoom in a bit. So let's put the Japanese task forces out here. We've got the second torpedo squadron, and that is task force eight. We've got the fifth cruiser division, and that's number seven, and the fourth torpedo squadron is task force number nine. For the allies, we have their task force seven counter and two dummies. So what we'll do, like we did in the last video, we'll turn them over, take them out a shot, give them a mix up, Bring them back into shot and mix them up again. 
and there we are the scenario starts on turn seven 1200 hours with the imperial japanese navy getting the initiative and just to remind you we'll be using this part of the sequence of play so it's naval movement both sides japanese going first of course because they have the initiative then any combat and then the administrative phase so what are we going to do well task force eight is the smallest of the task forces that the japanese have we really want to engage at least with task force seven and possibly one of the torpedo squadrons. So what we'll do, we can only move one hex, remember. We'll move this up. And this up. It would be better to go after these or these. Let's see how the allies move. Because remember, they're using that compass down at the bottom. A one, two, or three, they will move northwest. Four, five, or six, they'll come straight down west. They're moving northwest. So here they come. So there's no combat. The task forces aren't adjacent to each other. So we're into the administrative phase, which in this case just means we'll move along and turn the counter over as it's now the allies who have the initiative so they're moving six so they're moving due west all right look at that we're moving well let's see what this one is so we'll move this up we better bring this up in case that's a dummy so what have we got we've got the task force so these of course can now be removed and task force seven and eight will be attacking the allied task force seven so let's move over to the fleet sheets so here we are and we've got the allied task force seven which will be attacking the japanese fleet task forces seven and eight now there's no battle board as such so we have to conduct the battle here which is a little awkward but we'll get around it and this is the reason we've put the ships in sort of size order because it's the initiative player that decides the range of the attack and there is a priority order by gun range. So obviously a battleship with their big guns can fire at a further distance away than say a light cruiser. And if we did have a battleship with our task force, we could say it's just the battleship attacking and none of the smaller ships of the Japanese fleets would have guns that could return fire. So in our case here, we could have our heavy cruisers just conduct the attack and only the Japanese heavy cruisers could return because they're in range as well. So the light cruisers would have to get nearer and the destroyers would virtually have to be next door. So I think for this attack, we'll just use the allied heavy and light cruisers. That does mean that this light cruiser can return fire, but there's only one of them and the allies have got three here. So that's what we'll do. We'll bring in our ships so the light cruisers are in range and we will be using this value on the counter this is the firepower of the ship and the other thing is unlike air attacks where we can group the attacking aircraft together in one big force if we wished with naval battles we have to split them either into single attacks so this attacking this for instance or in pairs I think that's what we'll do for most of these. By the way, if it's a night attack, everything can be involved because uh, I assume at night distances are harder to calculate. So destroyers can creep up real close and 
fire at enemy ships. And for Japanese destroyers during the night, their firepower is doubled, which represents the increased effectiveness of their long lance torpedoes. So only during the night can everything creep up closer. But this is a daytime battle and the Allies have the initiative. So as I said, we're gonna use the heavy cruisers and the light cruisers. So what I'll do is we'll use these cubes. So I remember who's attacking who. We'll have the Exeter and the Houston attack together. And they'll attack the Natchi heavy cruiser. Then we'll have these two light cruisers, the Perth and the Java, attack the other heavy cruiser of the Japanese, the Haguro and the De Reuter light cruiser will attack the Jinsu light cruiser of the Japanese. Now we can do that because if you remember on the map, the Japanese task forces were adjacent to the allied forces on the map. Of course, during the Japanese initiative, they can pick how close they wanna be and which ships they want to use for their battle. But I think that's what we'll do for the allies and combat is simultaneous. So damage will be done after both sides have fired. The reason we have to designate what we're attacking before we attack is that if by chance, one of the ships of a pair actually sink the ship they're firing at, the other ship can't turn its guns onto something else. It's committed to fire at the same ship, even though she's been sunk. We'll be using a different table. This time we'll be using the naval combat chart. We're gonna combine the firepower, roll a die, and read off the damage. In this case, higher is better. And the only uh, dice roll modifier is for the Japanese. They get a plus one when attacking ships due, I think, to their greater experience at naval combat at this time of the war. So here we go. The Exeter and Houston have firepower of eight. Let's see if we can get this into shot. There we are. Let's see what they throw. Five. So five with a firepower of eight. Seven damage. The Nachi has a durability of five, so there will be some damage. But as I've just said, it's simultaneous. So we'll pop that there just to remind us. Yes, Ruff's done it again. You've noticed, haven't you, that uh, I misread the naval combat chart with a firepower of eight and a die roll of five. We should be doing seven points of damage. I put five down. I think I was confused by the die roll. So we'll put the correct amount there. Luckily, I noticed it before we went too far into the uh, naval battle. So apologies. But there we are. Seven points of damage to the Agaro there. And now we'll attack with the Perth and Java light cruisers against the Nachi there. Five again, but this time six firepower. And this time we do get five points of damage. And lastly, the De Reuter there against the Jinsu. Firepower of only three though, so we need a nice high roll. A four. One point. No, doesn't go anywhere near their durability. So that bounces off. Now the Japanese heavy and light cruisers will return fire. The two powerful heavy cruisers, Aguro and Nachi, will attack 
the Houston as she is significantly damaged to see if they can finish her off. And the Jintsu there, it'll have a go at the Exeter. Once again, just to remind you, this isn't a tactical masterclass. This is just me, Ruff, playing through the scenario, trying to learn the rules. And you will probably play this completely different. So there we are. We made our choices of targets. So the Haguru and the Nachi with 12 firepower. And not forgetting they have a plus one on their die roll. That's a five. Don't think the Houston has got much of a chance. So we've got 12 and we threw a five, four plus one. 11 points of damage for the poor Houston. And the Jinsu there attacking the Exeter. Firepower of four with a plus one again. Oh, crikey, another good throw. That's a six now. That's five points of damage. That will damage the Exeter. And now we can work out the damage. First for the Haguru there, seven. Five points of that will cause minor damage. And another one will flip it. So significant damage for the Haguru. Four isn't enough to do any more damage. The Nachi with five damage will get a minor damage counter. So the Allies have blooded the nose of the Japanese Navy, but now five points of damage for the Exeter, four will cause minor damage. There is one damage left, which will flip it. But for the poor Houston, four points will cause critical damage. And there's more than enough there to cause the Houston to sink. The Houston has gone. So we'll move these up. That's the end of the naval battle. Next is the admin phase and any ships with minor damage will attempt to do emergency repairs. And if they don't get any damage in the following turn, they will have repaired that minor damage. So this gets turned over. And that's the end of the turn. So we move along the turn marker, flip it over. We are now on turn nine, 1500 hours and the Japanese have the initiative. Now the Japanese have got to work out where the allied task force is going. As you know, the allies are controlled by the compass at the bottom of the board here, but the only two marked directions is northwest and west. And at the moment, they can't move through here, northwest, and the same here. In the scenario rules, there is a list of directions which the allies have to give precedence to. Here they are. Of course, it's northwest and west first. Then they'll try southwest, southeast, northeast, and east. So the Japanese have got to try and uh, block off and control the movement of the Allied Task Force. So we'll keep Task Force 7 there. And we'll move up Task Force 9. So at the moment, the task force is going to move here. 
We'll just move Task Force 8 here. Oh, actually, yes, that's worked out quite good. So doing that means that now I believe the Allied Task Force has to move northwest. It can't move west, of course. So once again, we'll be attacked by Task Force 7 and 8. I think that's right. So here we go again. It's the next naval battle. But this time the Japanese have the initiative. So once again, they're going to use these two to attack the Exeter, who has now got significant damage. Trying to knock out our heavy cruisers. Oops, forgot to mention, of course, they're using their heavy and light cruisers, keeping the destroyers back. So that's those two heavy cruisers. The Jintsu here is going to have a go at the Perth, I think, again. So there we are. They get a plus one, remember? So these are now reduced down to 10, which is still quite dangerous. Here we go. One. One plus one is two, of course. 10 firepower. Means they still do three points of damage. That is enough to cause a problem for the Exeter. And the Jinsu will now be attacking the Perth. Firepower of four. That's a bad throw. Firepower of four. With a three is only one damage. Not enough. So the Perth can breathe again. It is now the Allies to attack. So yes. They're going after the Nachi. If they can inflict some damage, that will negate that emergency repair they're trying to do. So we'll see if we can do something about that. The Java and the De Reuter here will be attacking the Haguru, who has significant damage. So fingers crossed for the Allies. Firepower of six, five, so six and a five is five damage. Yes. And the Java and the Reuter there. Let's see if they can do some more damage to the Hag Guru there. Oh, crikey. Well done. Six and six and six is eight damage. Okay. Let's do the damage. We'll do the uh, Exeter first. Unfortunately, being significantly damaged, getting the durability value there will cause the Exeter to be critically damaged and out of the game, really, because uh, no firepower is left. That's unfortunate. A guru here, four, will cause critical damage for them. So that means they've got four left, which is enough to sink the Haguru. And the Nachi here, it says in the rules, and if I'm understanding that correctly, if an attack results in any combat hit inflicted to a ship that has a minor damage marker, 
on its emergency repair status, which it has, the marker will show the minor damage status again. So five hits, durability of five. I assume it means we now flip this back and they are with minor damage again. If we'd have got six hits, that would have flipped it to significant. So hopefully that's played correctly. So we'll just move these up. Now the problem for the Allies is that this ship, the Exeter here, being critically damaged, can't fire. So it has to withdraw and try and make its way back to the Allied starting line, which was uh, back up east. Now we can withdraw it on its own or with escorts. That's some destroyers. But I think what we'll do is withdraw it on its own. It's going to take its own chances and we'll pop a withdraw marker. I'm not sure how to use these. I'm going to use them with the number and I'm going to put the other one with number one on it on the map on top of task force seven to remind us that that has to move back eastwards. There we are. We're in the admin phase. The Japanese ship, the Nachi here, unfortunately, still has its minor damage. So we're back to the map and we're going to move the turn counter along. So we will take turn counter. It's the Allies initiative. We've got the last daylight turn. Here's the withdraw counter representing the Exeter. So for movement, they've got to try, I think, and get back here, which is a problem. The Allied task force is going to have to move either here or here. Now they're clear. I'm just wondering if this moves into here, it's going to be attacked and probably sunk. But it does say in the rules we can either break off the formation and move the ship counter and any escorts you wish or none out of fleet formation or keep it in formation. I think it's going to be safer to keep it in formation at the moment, but then it says in each of its movement phase, it must head for the player's starting line. Well, I think that's a bit daft. I think it's going to keep with the formation and then hopefully if we can break free of the Japanese, maybe it can turn and move back. So I think what it's saying here, we will turn this over just to say it will be withdrawing and the same on the fleet sheet, just to remind us, hoping that's right. And we're going to throw the die and see which direction the allied task force is moving. So I'll pop that there for a sec. One, they're moving Northwest, which is, I think, quite good. So they're moving there. Of course, the Japanese will be encroaching. Task Force 7 will be moving here and 8 there. And Task Force 9 trying to encircle it. Although in turn 11, the night phase, I think the British will attempt to try and get away rather than obeying the compass direction. Yes, once we get to turn 11, they try to distance themselves from the Japanese and will not roll a die and they will avoid at all costs the zocks of the Japanese Navy and they will follow a slightly different direction precedence there. But we'll look at that if and when we get to turn 11. OK, here we go. It's another battle. So we're back again with the Japanese Task Force 7 and 8. Task Force 9 hasn't had a chance to do anything yet. And our poor beleaguered Allied Task Force 7. The Allies have the initiative. So the Exeter can't attack. So we've got to use light cruisers. I still don't want to bring in the destroyers because that means they can bring theirs in. 
I think the Allies will wait until the night's turn in case they can't get away, and then they'll use their destroyers. So we're just using the light cruisers, but this does mean the Japanese can use their heavy cruiser and light cruiser, as the heavy cruiser has a greater gun range. We'll have these two attack the... That's the Nachi there. And shall we have the Deuter attack it as well? Try and even things up a bit. Let's do that. I think we're allowed to do that as long as we designate that's the target. The Allies need some high die rolls here. So, the Perth and the Java, firepower of six. That's a five. So, firepower of six and a die roll of five is five points of damage. Ah, oh, that's a shame, but better than nothing, they say. Pop that there. And then the De Reuter with three firepower. Another high throw would be good for them. Six! Yes, say the Allies. <laughs> Dear oh law. So we've got uh, five power of three. That's the best they could do. And six, that's another four points of damage. Well done, the De Reuter. So they're going to be having nine points of damage. But it does mean now, before we can apply that damage, that the Japanese are firing back. There's no point really firing at the Exeter, only to get victory points, I suppose. I think their best course of action, tactically, is to attack those light cruisers. So this heavy cruiser will attack the Perth. Jinsu here will attack the Java. They get a plus one, remember? So, six firepower. Oh, ho, ho, one plus one is two, but it's six. Let's see what they do. No, it's only one point of damage. No good. And four firepower against the Java. Oh no! That's five. That's going to leave a mark. Five points. Now we work out the damage. So, nine points here. Oops, pausing the video so I could check on the damage allocation here for the um, Nachi. Go through the damage and forget to uh, unpause the video. So no real damage, we're just going to do it again. So nine points against the Nachi, who's already got minor damage. One more hit will flip. So we're down to eight damage points. Four more will cause critical damage. And yes, there's plenty left for another one to sink the Nachi. They're down to just their destroyers. For the Java, three points will cause minor damage. So two left. One more will flip it. So one left and, oh dear, lucky. They've got a durability of two. So that's all the damage they'll be receiving. Right, we're back on track and we're back to the map. So no minor damage. The turn counter gets turned around and we're into the first 
night turn. But unfortunately, I think this is now the end of the game because the Japanese have the initiative and will move first. And as I mentioned earlier on turn 11, the Abda fleet attempts to distance itself from the Imperial Japanese Navy. Instead of rolling a die, Abda will avoid all zocks of the Imperial Japanese Navy and follow this precedence here. It doesn't mean that the Allies can't move through an enemy zock, they just can't end up in one because this diagram seems to clarify that they're moving in to a zock but finishing outside a zock. So regardless of what the Japanese do, the Allies will be able to skedaddle away. Let's have a look. Now it says they can move two hexes. It doesn't say they have to. It just says in the rules, markers can move one hex during the day, two at night can. Not must. But even so, I think wherever the Japanese go, the Allies are going to be able to move in a direction that doesn't make them end up in a zock. So for instance, one, two, one, two, there we are, we've opened it up here. And if we move here, they'll be able to move this way. So yes, I can't see a way of moving these around without the Allies being able to escape. If I'm wrong, let me know. But I think this is now the end of the game because the Allies will now move 1-2. There won't be a naval battle and we're into the last turn. And the Allies will move first and they will just move there two spaces and these cannot catch them. So there we are. Mind you, it is only a learning scenario. So this movement with the, uh, the map compass wouldn't apply, of course. There we are. It's the end of the scenario. So we better see how well each side has done. So how well did the two sides do? We have a victory point table here. So let's see what was sunk for the Allies. They sunk the Haguru and the Nachi. And the Japanese sunk the Houston. So for each heavy cruiser sunk, that's three points. So the Japanese get three for that. The Allies get six. But we do have the critically damaged Exeter, and for that, the Japanese get another two, so it's close. Five victory points for the Japanese, and six for the Allies. Unfortunately, the Imperial Japanese Navy needed seven points more than the Allies to claim a major victory. So a bit of a draw there, but there we are. That's the end of the tutorial scenario number three, Battle of the Java Sea. So this has been another playthrough of Task Force Carrier Battles in the Pacific, a game by Jinichiro Suzuki and published by VUCA Simulations. The next scenario in the scenario book, scenario four, is a carrier versus carrier, a fictional scenario. Still a tutorial, but um, two players, so there will be that hidden information. So we'll see if we can come up with some house rules to play it solo, and we'll bring you that, if we can, in the near future. But I hope you enjoyed that and you found it interesting. If you did and you haven't done so already, it would be great if you would consider subscribing to the channel. It really does help. Another thing that helps tremendously is if you push the like button of the video, the thumbs up, 
And if you want to be informed of other content the channel uploads, then push the bell. By all means, leave a comment, especially if there's any misplays in the video. Not only will it help me, it will help anybody else that stumbles across this video wanting to know more. But do leave a comment because, as you know, I love to read them. Thanks, as always, to my subscribers. Thank you very much. And just before I go, as I always do, if you wish to support the channel a little bit further, well, now you can. You can buy the channel a coffee, and I'll leave a link in the description for that. Or you can push the super thanks button underneath this video. If you decide to do either of those, the channel and I thank you because it helps to keep it ticking along. Right then, until the next video, as always, you take care and goodbye.